better it is to be together. Amen? In the Lord's house that we could praise him this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come as your children, Heavenly Father, to call out to you, to cry out to you, to pray to you, to seek you. Oh, Heavenly Father, our expectation said when we seek with all our hearts that you would be found. So, God, we pray right now, Lord. Oh, Lord, that we would hear from you, from your word this morning. May your spirit cut us, convict us, place that seed onto the good soil, water it, God. We ask all these things because it's better to be in your house and in your courts than anywhere else. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for that, Lord. And we praise you. It's in your mighty name we pray. The name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. This morning we're going to continue on our series of the church. If you've got your Bible with you or your phone app, whatever it is, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter Chapter 1, verses 13 through 16 this morning. So you can turn there while you're turning there. This is an interesting season that we're in. The graduations that are out there between high school and college. There's many great speeches giving at these graduations. And, and as you listen to these speeches that are given to these different colleges and, and groups... There's, there's some things that are identical in all of them. They speak about the hard labor of the students, about the future of their lives, and they encourage them to pursue this hope, whether it be these career paths, whatever, maybe future education. It's, it's such an encouragement. There's hope when you can talk about a future beyond what you see. And you see some of these great speeches at colleges. This, you'll see them continually over the next few weeks. But here we've been talking about the church. And I believe in my heart that there's no better time that the church just needs to be encouraged. The church needs to be encouraged. The church needs to see a hope beyond today and a future. And what I find interesting in this text as we're going over this, we've talked about purpose and mission. What we're going to be talking about now over the next few weeks is the idea is since we know all of this, since we understand about a purpose and a mission, how do we articulate that in the body life of the church? How do we do it? And I don't want to cultural Christianity here and say, how do we do church? How do, we, how do we investigate what the Bible says that what we should be doing? Because we know that if we labor in his fields, this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. He says, our labor will not be in vain. What a promise of God that if we do what the Bible says, we follow the Lord, fruit will come. Fruit that he produces in people. And I think it's so important this morning so as we think about these things, as we think about the idea of how we actually operate, I think First Peter has something for us. Because even though the times might be uncertain for these students, working, coming into an economy that's been struggling and all these things, there's still hope. Well, in First Peter, he's writing to a people that had a lot of uncertainty. They were dispersed from their homes, they're living in a foreign land. So how is it that they could be the church in these situations? And I think that's what the Lord has for us this morning. So if you'd stand with me for the reading of God's word. 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 16. Beginning in verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action... And being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, 
you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would teach us this morning, Heavenly Father. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we're not trying to bounce around the Bible so you get an idea of what we think the church is. What we've been doing is looking at the scriptures itself to say, Lord, we want to be the church that you've designed, that you're building. We, we so desperately, our heart is that we want to be that. And this scripture here, is so powerful for us this morning. There's a lot for us here this morning. And I think in context here, we, we just got to bring this all into context because it'll help us, because he's going to further elaborate this throughout the epistle. And what we read in 1 Peter 1, verse 1 through 2, and he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He, and he's writing this epistle to those who are elect. Do you, do you see something all the way? He's writing to the church. He's writing to believers. It's not to the whole world. He's writing to a specific people in the church who are exiles of the dispersion. And then he names the places in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia according to the foreknowledge of God. That God knows God sent. He's going to have his gospel go to the ends of the earth. For the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for the people. See, there's a great benefit when we sit under the word of God, when we come together. There is a benefit of God's people even in these uncertain times. For the sanctification of the Spirit, for the obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling of His blood. What's very interesting is He uses the word elect, the chosen. See, this is about Christians. This is about identity. He wants us to know who He's writing to. How would they, how would they submit unto the word of the God if they didn't know God, or if they didn't know God's word? So it's pretty specific here. They're exiles. They're people in a foreign land. You might say, we've used the word aliens, residing in a foreign land. In other words, Peter's epistle is written to believers who have been forced from their homes and now scattered in the Roman provinces. And they've been heavily in influenced the pressure, the external pressures of the Greek culture are all there. They're exiles. And of the dispersion, the term comes from a Greek word meaning scattered or spread abroad. The purpose of this letter was to encourage the persecuted and bewildered Christians and to exhort them to stand fast in their faith. It's an encouragement and an exhortation. Peter stresses several themes in this whole epistle. One is, we talk about it a lot here, the already and not yet. You're already in the kingdom of heaven, yet you have not possessed it. What an encouragement to people that are dealing with the hard situations in their life. It's what a word for the church today in uncertain times. That we live in a time that a lot of uncertainty throughout the globe, yet we are already... This is a truth that you need to hold on to. That you're already there, yet you have not gained possession of it. And then you're living like an exile. We are not home. What a word for the church. And we'll look at a little bit of that this morning. We're living in exile. You might say, well, it doesn't feel like exile. But it, what the church should know, without a shadow of a doubt, what the scriptures teach, there's a city not built by hands, but God himself, and that is your home. And right now you're sojourning, 
you're exiled onto a foreign land as we gather in Mansfield. But we're living like exiles. This is not our home. Having this understanding really helps us understand how to live. If we're just living for today in this world, we're going to be disappointed. But there is a glorious city. Streets paved with gold. There's a, a throne and a river and a stream and trees planted on the side of it. And on the walls of this city, onyx and beautiful gems. This is our home. What an exciting time it will be the day that we get to partake in that home. And he's also calling and writing in this epistle for the suffering of believers to stand firm, to be encouraged, to continue. See, what's interesting, and it's interesting for us, this world that we're in and that we're exiled to, we're purposed by God himself, by the foreknowledge of God, to make a difference in the world. It's the world that we're not living in, that's not our home, that we're meant to influence, that we're meant to give this gospel. We're meant to show Christ to this world for them and for us. And we should be encouraged by this word this morning. What, what should we be doing? What should we be doing amid these difficult times and circumstances? That's for this church and, and for us as well. How does the purpose and the mission remain steadfast in times of, it might seem like even persecution sometimes. See, these are good questions and observations for us. But what is clear here is we understand that our purpose, that we're to equip others, preach the gospel, equip them, build up the body with biblical instruction, Bring the, through teaching unity of faith, through the knowledge of the Son, bringing them to maturity in the Word, standing on sound doctrine that the believers would not be swayed by every wind of doctrine or false teaching. But it stands on the glorious lighthouse as a beacon. This is the church, the light in a foreign world, in a fallen land, that we could be a light that pierces the darkness. The church of Jesus Christ has power, and we're meant to influence the world. And when we understand the mission to make disciples, preaching the gospel, baptizing them, bringing them into the church, maturing them in the word, for them to obey all that the Lord has commanded, equip them for the journey that they are on, just like us, and we're to do all these things in a foreign land. You won't have to do it anymore when you're with the Lord. We're to do it now. So, in fact, a Christian's view about life on earth should be as a sojourner in a foreign land. Our true home is a heavenly city that we long for. So, if there's a foundational truth for the church today, it's this. You can write this down. The church that Jesus is building is a called, sanctified Holy people. The church that Jesus is building is a called, sanctified, holy people. A, a starting question for us this morning maybe should be this. How should the church approach this task? And what method should the church use to accomplish these things? Last week we said, and we say it again today, that the church is meant to change the world. This is no small task given to the church. In the book, The Church, by Jeffrey Johnson, he, he writes this, and I thought this was good. He says, practically speaking, the church is not to be influenced and shaped by the culture. The church should not redefine or restructure itself to be more acceptable to the world. Rather, we ought to be sanctified, meaning set apart. Influ a set apart influence to the culture. The church, and it's this very point, he says, the way the church engages the culture that the church is tempted to abandon its purpose. We're called, this text says, to be holy. Set apart 
for God. Now, there's something in this text that we need to understand as we, we go through this, that Christ, through Christ's salvation, and through Christ's work on the cross, you're justified to him, you're reconciled to a holy God. But not only that, they don't end there. For us, they give us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit for the purpose of sanctification. A process that he uses in us and for us, one, to reach the world, but also to transform us and prepare us for home. And this is so important for us as we look at this text this morning. So my first point is preparation and knowledge and obedience. We see in the first couple of verses. Therefore, preparing your minds for action. I love the way the Apostle Peter begins this section with connect, this connecting word, therefore. You ever read your Bible and like one word sticks out to you for a particular time? That's the Holy Spirit working in you. And you need to just stop and listen to this word. Therefore. Now I know that when we teach here we say, okay, we say therefore, you say. Thank you. But this word therefore here, it just jumped out at me. It jumped out at me. Because there's something here. Because this therefore is a connecting say because of something there's something else. There's a cause and effect here. And what is he speaking of? When we look at verses 3 through 7, it says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again. God intervened in your life. God did something in your life. Therefore, do you see the impact of this word? He caused you to be born again to a living hope. A hope that's real. A hope that's not a guess. A hope that's not a myth. He gives you eyes to see beyond the horizon, to see something that we would labor in and serve in, him in. A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the gospel to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trial. There's an already and not yet, and you're therefore so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This word, therefore, jumped off the page at me. It jumped off the page. Beloved, I want you to see something this morning. This is so precious. This is better than gold. Better than silver. That we skip over these words of the Bible so quickly. Therefore, we want to get to what the therefore is all about. And we don't stop and, and think about the magnitude of this word therefore. Because of all what Christ did on the cross. Because of all these things that he's done for you. He called you out of darkness. He brought you into the kingdom of light. He washed your sin. He re the remission of sin. He's given you new life. He did it by the word of truth. And now the truth is in you. He cleansed your heart of sin. And he gave you a new heart. He sprinkled you clean. The church that Jesus is building is found in the therefore. The church that he's building is not formed on myths. It's not formed on mythology or stories. It's literally the Son of Man coming from heaven and complete humiliation goes to the cross for our sin. And because of that, your testimony has a therefore. 
The reason why you're here is because there's a word therefore, and you could tell everybody about the past. See, this word therefore is so important for us. We need to look back and look at what Jesus Christ has done for us. And to know this, this is our testimony to the world. It's not what we've done. It's what he did. Therefore. He opens up a door with this. He opens up a door that you wouldn't forget where you walked from. Because it becomes so part of your own personal testimony. There is a therefore in your testimony. There is a therefore in the testimony of the church. There's a therefore that people need to hear and understand because of Christ. And then it goes on to say this beyond the therefore. It says, prepare your minds for action. The Christian's preparation is intentional for the mission. That we should be doing something. What should we be doing as a church right now as we look at what the church is all about? It's about preparing. It's intentional. It begins with the word of God for the knowledge of God. Understanding what God prescribes in the scriptures and what he describes for us. The scriptures are the Holy Spirit inspired word to guide the individual Christian and the church. We should be preparing our minds for action. It means discipline to be in the word. And it's a necessity for the church. Because this is a call to action for us. And the methods are found in scripture. See, the biblical truth is this, that the world values, man-centered things, are in direct opposition to the spiritual values of the church. So if we're serving him as sojourners into a world where we go, it's in direct opposition to the God that we serve and the message that we hold. Direct opposition. In John 15... 18 through 19 says, If the world hates you, know that it's hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as his own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If you're going into the world to serve the Lord, to make a bunch of friends, you're in trouble. They're just not going to receive it. But we should expect it. So many people, especially, they say, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out in faith and I'm going to try to share my faith. And so you get into work and, man, it just becomes this big disaster. And then you walk away and you say, wait a minute, I don't think that's my gift. I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. That's not what the scriptures are saying. The scriptures are saying, I've called you out of darkness and brought you to the light. I've given you new birth and now you're a sojourner on this earth and I'm depending on you. You've got a message of a gospel of hope and I'm just telling you to go. And guess what? Not everybody's going to want to hear it. Some might outline you, they just might reject it. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting the source. So keep going. This is a call to action for the church. That Jesus is building. It's one that we shouldn't compromise the gospel. Because we're afraid of people. Or to the culture. Or to the world. We shouldn't compromise. Rather we should stand out. Illuminate yourself. The worst type of Christian is a chameleon Christian. Sunday morning. We all look Christian. Tomorrow. We're going to look like the world. Are we? He says we really should stand out. This verse continues to say this. Not only prepare our minds for action. Be sober minded it says. Be sober. Prepare. Be sober. Set yourself on hope. Be sober minded. What does this imply? It means do not entertain the world into your heart and your mind. 
You're not supposed to drink the world's Kool-Aid. You're not supposed to get intoxicated by the things of this world. You're not supposed to idolize the things that this world idolizes. This is like totally breaking apart everything about this world. And what's left after everything is broken apart is you. And we're supposed to stand out and be different. We're supposed to be sober-minded. We give ourselves totally, fully to God and to seek to be rooted in his ways. Conducting yourselves with a sober mind. It's amazing. See that there's a difference. This is what we should be doing. What we're doing internally reflects outwardly to the world. It says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's even looking forward, preparing our minds for action. In view here is a mind setting its focus forward, living in eternity, having eternity in view, the already and the not yet. This is the way elect exiles should conduct themselves in a foreign land. We're to live for Christ. This is what Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 through 27 says. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or the left. Turn your foot away from evil. What a word for, the, for us this year and for the church in general. To stay the course that we're to follow him. The apostle Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 3. He says this, strain forward to what lies ahead. Press on toward the goal of the upward call of God. Knowing the word fills the mind and influences the heart. Because we're not only just to know. We're not supposed to, we're not coming together to be encyclopedias or professors. We are here to worship our Lord and to learn what he desires for us and obey them. Have action behind it. We're to obey him. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, the old self. See, now we're in a relationship with a holy God and we can call him and cry out to him, Abba, Father, Daddy. He is our Father. So us as obedient children, we can serve our heavenly father. We can be obedient to him, not because a church is telling you to do it, because God himself has called you into this relationship and made you one of his own, that you are a new creation in him. This is amazing. What should we be doing? We should be preparing ourselves in the word of God, for the days to come. What does that look like? I don't know if you know. I don't know. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be famines. There's going to be all of this. Who knows? So we've got to prepare our minds for it. So you're not caught surprised. And that even during these times, we're called to be the church with a purpose and a mission that should not stop should be engaging. We should be engaging more into it in the times that we live. We're part of God's family and we're called to this labor. We're to be shaped and influenced by the Lord. Romans 12, one of Bobby's favorite verses, one and two, I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And again here, do not be conformed to this world. Cultural Christianity will get you nowhere. Living like the fallen isn't going to bring anybody to Christ. He does the work. You preach the message. You stay the course and allow God to do what God only God does. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. 
when you see who you've been praying for for such a long time come to faith and start walking with the Lord, all you can do is give praise to him. This is a transformation of your mind. You needed to be reminded about this. He does the salvation. We do the proclaiming. He changes the heart and mind of man, woman, and children. He says this, by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable to perfect. Unless you start walking in the ways of the Lord, how will you know? How will you know? Is when you preach and share the gospel with someone. Maybe you share your therefore. And then move into the gospel and you see someone just illumined from the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And they come into this saving relationship. You get the chance to be renewed in your mind. And know with all assurance what the will of God is. Second is personal holiness is the sanctification of the believer. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Can I ask you a question? If you had to write a paper on holiness, how would you define it? This word is probably used least in church today. What does it even mean? What does it mean? Is it important? It is important. Holy means, for God it would mean set apart, transcendent, perfect, and spiritually pure. There is nobody else like him. There is, you might meet some great people in your life, but there is no one like our God. There is no one holy like him. But for the believer, it's our sanctification. It's our process of being made holy as the one who called us is holy. Look what it says in Psalm 99 verse 9. I'll give you a little King James for my friends out there this morning. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy transcendent, set apart, no one like him. 1 Samuel 2, verse 2, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. He is the only, the perfect, true God. And Leviticus 11, verse 44, in the King James, this is what he quoted this morning in 1 Peter. For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves. Set yourself apart. And ye shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall ye defile yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Meaning, don't drink the world's Kool-Aid. Don't live like the world. He's called you. His own. His child. You're his possession. You're an heir of the kingdom. A co-heir with Christ. This is what the scriptures say. Oh, the holiness of God is so important for us to understand what it means for us. And you cannot help but go to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. And one called to another. This is the chart. These are the angels saying this about God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Can you imagine saying you believe in God but have no idea what this God is like? He's holy, 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 thrice holy. God is love. God is just. God is all these things. But there is no place in scripture that uses a word like holy so emphatically, three times, thrice holy. And he says to us, for you also be holy in some of your conduct. No, that's not what the Bible says. I'm tricking you. You also be holy, if you can, in your conduct. That's not what the Bible says. 
You also, you, each one of you here, me, be holy in all your conduct. All. You know what the Greek word here is for all? All. All. Wait a minute. All my conduct? Yes. When you, when you, when the passions come and you want to open up your computer and look at things that you don't want to and you're in your own room, no, all your conduct is his. He knows all these things. What you listen to, what you're thinking about, and all your conduct, he's in telling us that you've been set apart for a purpose, a holy purpose, and all our conduct is submitted to God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we are always to thank God for you because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and through belief in the truth. What a prayer. What a prayer for us, the church. God chose you to be saved. He called you to himself. He set you apart in a foreign world and a time, and by the power of the Holy Spirit and through the belief in the truth, this is how we walk. And here's some aspects of sanctification being set apart. One is this, it's positional sanctification, which you possessed, every believer possesses from the moment of your conversion. From the time that you were converted by Jesus Christ, you're automatically set apart his. You're sanctified. Guess what? This, this positional sanctification, you had no choice in. He didn't ask for your opinion. He didn't say, you know what? I'm going to save you, but what do you think? No. This is positional sanctification. He, he gave you new life, and upon your conversion, you've been set apart for him. Second, progressive sanctification this is the ongoing daily growth in grace for the believer, becoming in practice more set apart for God's use. Progressively, we have our will, but we also have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to instruct us and to grow us and to change us. 2 Corinthians 3.18, being transformed from one degree of glory to another. But you know, there's a, another type of sanctification we want to take a moment and look beyond the horizon, the ultimate sanctification. This is attained only when we are fully and completely set apart to God in heaven. He personally sanctified you. Positionally, you're set apart from him. He's growing you through the power of the Holy Spirit and sanctification, and he's going to call you home that you be with him. No sin in heaven. Ultimate sanctification. Our God is perfectly and fully holy, transcendent, and there's no one like him. He's thrice holy. And if our holy, holy, holy God has set you apart for himself, be holy as is written, because I am holy. I don't know if uh, Hebrews 12, if that's a familiar verse in verse 14 to you, but it says this. Strive for peace with everyone, for, the holy, for without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Is holiness important? Yes. In fact, this is what the church should be doing, living set apart for a holy God. And there's no greater work for the church. And I think this is important. Because it's what we think about God and have an understanding of his holiness and how we've been set apart for holiness should really direct everything we do as a church. Everything we do as a church should reflect him. In that book, The Church, he talks about two great cautions, and I thought this was really important. Here's the first one. He says it's about minimizing minimizing and there is two of them minimizing the holiness of the church 
If the church compromises their pursuit of holiness for the sake of broadening their impact and influence on society, even though it's not all bad, this is not our central objective. Because once reaching man becomes more of a concern than glorifying Christ, the pursuit of the church will be given over to methods, man methods. It'll be about drawing them to church. Everything's about bringing them to church. Look at it later on, 1 Peter in chapter 2, he writes this in verse 5. But he's talking to the church. You yourselves are like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We should not minimize the holiness of the church, the set-apartness to the church. The church should not be like the world. It should be separate. It should be the beacon of light for the world to attract those lost ships back to shore. If you need an image, a lighthouse. And then he goes on to say this, so we should be warned not to minimize the holiness of the church but we should not minimize the unholiness of the world. See, if we become a seeker-sensitive church that lowers the standard of holiness within the church, the next logical step is to raise the level of goodness of those outside the church. When it becomes hard to distinguish between the culture of the church and the culture of the world, the church will soon perceive mankind as basically good. The great problem of society will, will no longer be sin. Maybe it will be about hunger, benevolence, social justice. It will be those things. It won't be dealing with sin. No longer does the world need a Christ then to be a redeemer who saves mankind from the depravity of sin, but for Christ to be a great example who brings relief to the oppressed, the underprivileged, the sick, and the hungry. You can find that on page of 109 on the church. This is what the Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy all about. He says, I charge you in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is the judge, the living, and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Don't compromise the word you got to understand he was a young young pastor all these older folks were they going to listen to him he said listen you preach the word of God the truth and be ready in season out of season what does that mean in our vernacular whether whether you're ready for it or not make sure it's here that any given time that you can just give it that you can tell the glory and the hope that you have in Jesus Christ and he says to reprove and rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming, it says, when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Mean that they don't want to hear about their own sin. They want to find someone who'll say, hey, you know what, that's all right. God loves you anyway. You go do what you want. There's preachers out there that's preaching that gospel. The people today. He says, preach the word. Let them find these people. And we'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off to myths. You know what a, what, you know what a myth is? God's got a great plan for your life here. How do you know that? I might have to suffer a sickness that I'm not prepared for. To bring glory to his name. Myths are things that you put out there that sound so good and may sound real, but are not real. And they walk away from the truth. He says, preach the word. And what does he say to him? As for you, Timothy, always be sober-minded. Don't drink the Kool-Aid of the, the culture, of the world. He says, endure suffering. Suffering. And do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Charles Spurgeon won the same thing. The new plan is to assimilate the church to the world. 
This is a new plan. This is what they call progressive. And so include a larger area within its bounds. By semi-dramatic performances, they make houses of prayer to approximate to the theater. They turn their services into musical displays, their sermons into political and ph philosophical essays. In fact, they exchange the temple for the theater. They turn the ministers of God into actors whose business is to amuse men. Listen, this was written in 1888. Well, let me just tell you something else. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy 64, between 64 and 68 A.D., this is not a new problem. We think of it as a new problem. This has been going around a long time. So what do we do with this text when it tells us to be holy and set apart? How do we do this? What, what should we can be concerned about as individual Christians and the church? The first thing is this. Grow in its sanctification. We should grow in our sanctification. The pursuit of holiness. It's not so much about regulating your external behaviors as much as it is focusing inward in a devotion and love to our God and the church. What happens in us reflects out of us and it affects every area of the church. We need to grow in sanctification. We're to love him, church. Simply love him with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. This type of love has pure motives for Christ. It will reflect to the world Christ glorified and Christ magnified. We don't need to overcomplicate this. As we bring the word into us, as we grow in the word, we grow in our sanctification. And from the times that you spend in the Bible and prayer with the Lord, over time, that just reflects out of you. It may reflect out of you in compassion and love for others because you love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This isn't a decree for the church. It's God's calling for you, the church, that would just love him that way with everything, all our heart. You know, you struggle with this. And it, we need to be practical when we talk about these things because guess what? That's telling me that I need to love him more than I love my children, more than I love my grandchildren. And I think they know how much I love them. That nothing would make me compromise the love of God because he's called us out. He's given us new life. We need to grow and bring the word of God into us so we can reflect Christ to this world that's not our home. We need to labor this way to change the world. I'll tell you, this type of love, this type of word can break down the barriers of the culture with the gospel. Not us changing to the culture thinking that'll break down the barriers. The pursuit of holiness. Let me just end with a word that comes from our Lord in John's gospel. He's getting ready for the cross. He spends much time in prayer. And he says this. He's praying to, the, to his father for you, for the church. I've given them your word. And the world has hated them from, because they are not of this world. You're not of this world. Just as I am not of this world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. But that you keep them from the evil one. You don't drink the Kool-Aid of the world. Be sober minded. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them. Set them apart. Sanctify them. In the truth. And your word is truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for your word. It is the lamp to our feet and the light to our path, God.
And all that we do should reflect your holiness, Heavenly Father. So we come together and we pray and we seek you, Heavenly Father, that you would just help us in this, God. Oh, just to be reminded this morning that you are a holy, thrice holy God, that there is no one like you, and that the power of the gospel that you've taken us out of darkness and brought us into the light, that you've called us by name and you've given us new life in Christ, that we'd be born again to a living hope, a hope that sees past the current circumstances, the times that we live. No, there's a greater hope beyond the horizon. That there is a day, a glorious day, when our Lord Jesus Christ will come again and the shouts of archangels will be heard all through the world. Triumph, triumph, our King is coming. And Heavenly Father, we pray. As we study the church and we look at weeks to come in the area of worship, how we should come to you, what we should be doing, Heavenly Father. I pray that you would instruct us and teach us, guide us, Heavenly Father, into all your truth, that we could be your obedient children, that we could follow after you. So, Heavenly Father, I pray if there's someone in this room that doesn't know you, God, that maybe even these words of holiness and understanding that today is anew. I pray by, the, by your name, Heavenly Father, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, if it's your will, God, for new life, a resurrected life, that they could set their feet on the ground today anew, afresh, a child. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would Use those individuals to carry this gospel just like us, God. That we could grow them in your word, that they could walk victoriously with you. Heavenly Father, we pray that maybe some of us just needed that reminder and encouragement today to walk, that you're called, that you've been given, and it's been lavished upon you, the grace of God, fully. He held nothing back. He's given it all that we might walk worthy of the gospel. So, Heavenly Father, whatever the circumstance, Heavenly Father, we say this, that you are God and there is no other. So, Lord, we pray and we just ask in your name, and we just pray that you are glorified here today. In Jesus' name, amen.